Good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening for some of us, depending where you are in the world, of course. Welcome to the TIP Diversity Committee launch party. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Debbie Menon. I'm the Vice President of Communications, Media and Entertainment, and your host today. So, hello. We're absolutely thrilled to be hosting TIP's first diversity committee webinar focused on women. So, quick story. A year and a half ago, I was given an opportunity to curate and moderate a women in technology webinar. Now, I'm sure we've all been in this position before where someone asks you to literally go way out of your comfort zone and you have no choice other than to be comfortable. And that I did. So long story short, I've been web moderating these webinars, women in tech, women in leadership for the last year and a half. And they have been so incredibly inspiring, fulfilling, and the topics are just simply priceless. So when we heard that TIP wanted to start a new initiative around a diversity committee focused on women, Tech Mahindra was all in. So we're really looking forward to hearing from the great minds of Colleen Powell. She's the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at American Power Company. Carolyn Chan, Vice President, GM, 5G Infrastructure Network Platform Group at Intel. And Azita Arvani, the General Manager of Rocketon Symphony. Now, the great news is, is Azita was on the very first panel that we hosted a year and a half ago, so it's great to have her back. We're very excited about the agenda with these fabulous women today. You'll learn more about the TIP program, the diversity committee. We'll hear the benefits of becoming a member, why diversity is of great value, the importance of being an ally, and why a collaborative approach is a good thing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Lori Fontana. So Lori is the technical lead manager at Meta and the connectivity sourcing team. Now, let me tell you a little bit about her past. So prior to Meta, she spent 15 years working on international development. That's a part of economic and humanitarian programs in developing countries, focusing on gender equality and improving the economic status of women. Now, that is impressive. So she earned her bachelor's degree at Vanguard University of Southern California and her master's degree from university, oh, sorry, from American University She's a mom of a daughter, daughter's hilarious, brave, full of adventure, probably just like her mother. So Lori's moderating today, and she's currently our co-chair for the TIP Diversity Committee. So over to you, Lori. Awesome. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so as Debbie mentioned, I'm Lori Fontana. I work with Meta Connectivity. I'm also a co-chair of the TIP Diversity Committee. And before we jump into introductions of our panelists, I want to tell you just a little bit about TIP and the Diversity Committee. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Telecom Infra Project, what we've been calling TIP, it's a member-based community of telecom companies and organizations that collaborate together to build new technologies and business approaches, uh, specifically around uh, open disaggregated network solutions. So that's TIP. Um, we've recently launched the Diversity Committee through TIP last year. And it's made up of a core group of different telecom companies. Uh, currently, there are eight different telecom companies who've joined together. And the vision of this group is really simply to increase, increase diverse voices in the telecom space. And for 2022, we're being very focused and we're going to, uh, you know, really target increasing the number of women in the telecom space. Um, so I'm so excited truly honored to be sitting with these women um, and to have a conversation about the value of diversity with our three panelists. So before we jump in, I'm gonna allow each of you to briefly introduce yourselves. Um, so Caroline, why don't we start with you? I am Caroline Chen. I've been uh, with Intel really working on 5G edge and running, leading the path to into the open and desegregated 5G network. On my spare time, I also serve on a TIP uh, board, and I am still the only female member of the TIP board. That just shows you how badly we need diversity, we need women in the telecom industry. And I've just been told I'm the longest serving board member. Please, we need more diversity in telecom. <laughs> um, I, I really, uh, 
I'm passionate about this and I'm really looking forward to this uh, uh, conversation. Thank you, Azita. Hi, um, I'm Azita Arwani. I'm general manager of Rocket and Symphony Americas, and I also head the global government affairs. Uh, I actually started my career as a computer scientist and experienced the power of software firsthand and how software is eating the world. But uh, when I came to telco industry, I realized that software uh, was not eating the telco industry. <laughs> um, we were dealing with a lot of complex custom appliances, very a hardware based tightly coupled software so when uh, rocket then decided to become a mobile network operator using open uh, radio access networks using cloud native i was super excited uh, to be part of the company that's disrupting the telecom industry and um, you know i've been in technology and telecom business for over 20 years uh, always on the leading edge of technology, and I find it very, very exciting. And uh, uh, like uh, Caroline said, it's um, unfortunately the number of women in the technology and telecom world is not growing as fast as we'd like to go. And hopefully, the TIP Diversity uh, Committee will will help uh, grow that number. Thanks, Azita, and and Colleen. Last but not least. Sure. Thank you so much. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here with you and thank you for inviting me to talk with this terrific group of fabulous and dynamic women. I am the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer at American Tower and we are the largest owner of wireless infrastructure. And so we own cell phone towers around the globe in 25 countries and we also just purchased a data center so we are expanding our capabilities we um and one of the things that made me actually come to this role was that i really felt that at this point in time um one of the things one of the many things that we learned during covid is the criticality of being online um if you could do your job online if you could learn online you had more access to healthcare, education, um, to ways of making money, and those who weren't online, we actually saw a new kind of digital divide. People who were not able to do jobs remotely, people like hairdressers or cab drivers or people who um, may be servers at a restaurant, were not able to have access to critical information, to um, telehealth, to ways of making money. And so I felt like this was really a the most critical thing that I could do at this time in my career. So I literally joined um, last year and I'm so excited to be here and also to be having this conversation with all of you. Thank you. Uh, just if, if you haven't already picked up on the passion um, for, <laughs> from these women on this topic, uh, you will as we dig into this conversation. But I'm just again, thank you all for being here and participating. Um, all of you are members of the TIP Diversity Committee. Um, you're all helping to drive the vision and the mission of this group. And so um, because of that, I, I wanted to start off just by talking about a little bit about our motivation and, and what's compelled us to be a part of this committee. I know you've touched on it, um, but I wanted to dig in just a little bit more. And I'll start um, for me, as Debbie mentioned, I come from an international development background. And it, it is very well known in that industry that economically empowered women are the major catalysts for development, mainly because they're reinvesting into their children's health, their nutrition, um, their education. So by reducing gender inequality, it's really considered, frankly, smart economics. Um, and it's not only just in our projects, it was in the field itself, it was just more diverse. So you can imagine coming into the uh, tech industry, uh, what a culture shock it was. Uh, to see how male dominated it was. And so that was one of the reasons. Uh, the other is, as Debbie mentioned, I'm a mom and my daughter is as interested in princesses as she is in bugs and superheroes. So we don't know what industry she's want, going to want to go into. And we just want to open up those opportunities for her and other girls like her um, so that they have the options and, and the availability to get into the tech industry as well as others. So. That's personally uh, why I'm motivated to be a part of the committee. Um, now, Carolyn, you've mentioned that you're a co-founder of TIP. 
and still the only woman sitting on the board of directors. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about what that experience is like for you and how did this inspire you to join the committee? So the funny thing is, I, I never consider my gender for any kind of a hindrance to me because I was born to parents. My mother was one of the first engineers the degree holder in China. This is back in the old country. So it's my dad. In fact, they met in university and my mom's class ranking was much, much higher than my father. So I always thought that my dad married up. So she, I was never taught that math is hard. I always thought that I was going to be an engineer. I went to University of Texas in Austin. I graduated with engineering degree, uh, electrical among very few women. I never thought that was actually any kind of a hurdle to me until I joined the industry. And I was with a company called Nortel and no longer exists. And really, when you go into the RF field, they have so few women, it's not even funny. And then we, and then once I joined Intel, and then we started looking at network function virtualization, network transformation, we co-founded TIP. And then you really realize that Many times I was only only women in the room, only women in the uh, in the panel. We call it manual. Sometimes it's just all men, <laughs> men in the panel. So we started thinking through like this is like Colleen. I really agree with you. The what happened in the last two years provided digital divide. One of the first project we did was to provide private networks to an underserved school in Sacramento, ISD. You would not think in Sacramento there will be underconnected community. Absolutely was. So together with our ecosystem, we went in and wire up the the housing projects around the elementary school, providing not just fair connectivity, but rich connectivity. So the children can learn just as well as the wealthy suburban children can. And that really inspired us. There was a, there's a video uh, filmed with the, the principal, the parents, the PTAs, and to all talk about how that changed their children's lives. And, and Colleen, you're absolutely right. As women, as mother, as wife, and we all has an extra passion about how our children fares. We want our children to get the best equal treatment I like your title, equity. It's not just about diversity, it's about equity. We got to treat everybody equally as much as we can. So this is why connectivity is so important, telco is so important, and having a diverse people talent in the field, it really opens up and you look at a problem statement differently. You look at a solution uh, differently. So I, I, I am committed, uh, like you and I talked about, we needed to, change the industry, starting with changing how TIP as, as, a, as a board, as how we uh, you know, engage in our ecosystem. That's why I'm very passionate about TIP diversity uh, committee. Yeah, and that reminds me of what Azita was telling me a few weeks ago about how, you know, we talk about TIP's role in open architecture and how important it is to increase participation in telecom. Uh, Zita, could you tell us a little bit more about that and how that idea relates to the vision of TIP Diversity Committee? Sure, I'd be happy to. So in Rocket and Symphony and, and Rocket and Mobile, we believe in bringing a very affordable, secure and agile connectivity to everybody. And of course, with 5G, we we're thinking not just consumers, but also industries, communities, cities and all that. And to do that, we are using the open architecture and also cloud native architecture, disaggregating radio access network, all the things that telecom infra project is, is has the mission to do, you know, the uh, deploying and, and developing open disaggregated standards based uh, solutions for connectivity. So that mission is very aligned with what what tip is doing. In addition, diversity is something that I, I feel very passionately about. I'm a big proponent of diversity in the workplace. For me, combining 
the the the, the sort of the personal passion on the diversity side and also the the alignment of the objectives for bringing connectivity to everybody and every industry in the world in a very cost effective manner and uh, together is uh, really puts it together that tip diversity committee is something that I want to be part of. Yeah, I mean, it, there really is a, a business value to diversity. It's, it's not just Absolutely. about, hey, you know, equal, you know, opportunity and we want, you know, obviously we want our daughters and, and children to be able to enter in whatever industry they would like to go in, but there really is a business value value for diversity. Um, I, I was reading uh, the World Economic Forum and they were saying, you know, this was in 2020, but I don't think much has changed yet, but the greatest uh, challenge preventing the economic gender gap from closing is women's underrepresentation in emerging tech roles. Um, and, and, you know, th that was only two years ago and, and I don't think much has changed. So, you know, if technology is supposed to service the whole of humanity, the big decisions need to be taken from a, a balanced perspective. Um, so, Colleen, I wanted to give you a chance to also um, tell us why you were compelled to join the diversity committee. Um, and in addition to that, you've also been quoted as saying diversity is the greatest of innovations. So I'd love to hear you talk more about that as well. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Lori. Mm -hmm. I think that it's a couple of things. So number one, I think you're right that a lot of the issues that we see, even in pay gaps, are really issues of a lack of representation. And given that technology undergirds every single aspect of our lives, and to be honest, think back to when you were in kindergarten. Getting online was not necessarily something that we were necessarily thinking about then. Um, it was sort of like playing with blocks and playing with your friends and sitting with a circle. But, you know, having a young child, I would say tech is very much at the center and particularly tech during COVID. It enabled children to continue learning and continuing to engage, even though they were remote. This is even more important, I think, globally, where resources may vary from community to community, but you actually, through the Internet, can have access to global resources. It is a huge um, just equalizer. It can be a huge equalizer. You know, at American Tower, one of the things that also compelled me to come is that we have a program called Digital Communities, where we provide um, we provide access to the internet for communities that are rural or disconnected. And so we do this all around the globe. There are a lot of them in India. There are some of them in Africa. We're trying to do them all around the globe. We're trying to build um, several thousands of these. We're a few hundred in. And what we find is that the people who have access to them, not only do they have access to the internet and all of those resources, but they have access to financial on, you know, financial resources, I, access to being able to work from a remote environment, mm -hmm. access to be able to work and take care of children, um, access to educational resources. And also, um, sometimes it's the only source of clean water and bathrooms in some of these communities. So it's really one of those th ways that um, I think, you know, it's one of the ways our company thinks about, but I'm certain all of your companies think about how can we actually provide for the better good, for the greater good? How can we make sure technology advances? Speaking of technological advance, one of the things you asked about was innovation. And diversity really is something that creates innovation. Why? Because you find that companies that are more diverse and have more diverse representation in their senior leadership team, McKinsey did a huge study with 383 companies, and they found that the companies that had the highest gender representation had were 25% more profitable than companies that had the lowest were in the lowest quartile of gender representation in their leadership. Companies with racial and ethnic um, representation, the highest quartile, were 30, 36% more profitable than companies in the lowest quartile of representation. Also, you find on Boston Consulting Group, another global consulting firm, did a study. They found that companies that had above average diversity scores were 45% more had more had 45% more of their revenue coming from innovation than companies with the lower diversity scores with when they were below average that revenue number was more around 26%. Why is that? Um it's really because com groups that um have diversity and inclusion meaning not just representation but representation that really feels included that will speak up that may disagree 
will actually have a bit more friction sometimes, but that friction leads to better decisions, leads to better results and better solutions. They come up with more solutions. They come up with better solutions and often they are able to um, that friction leads to um, a disintegration of groupthink. If we're all alike and we all think similarly and all have similar backgrounds, we're less likely to challenge one another's views. We're more likely to have potential biases that can creep in and block us from an alternative view or an alternative solution. Whereas diverse teams bring up more solutions to increase the, like, like, the likelihood mm -hmm. that one of them will be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was also reading there's there's undeniable evidence now that women, when women join the C-suite, they don't just bring new perspectives, right? They're actually shifting how the C-suite thinks about innovation. Um, and, and, you know, they're, well, it makes me think, Carolyn, when we were talking um, a few weeks ago, how um, you brought up an interesting experience you had, right? When Intel was looking at investing in, in farms in North Dakota. Um, yeah. and, and you being the only woman, um, who was part of making the decisions, you actually shifted the way that everyone thought about this project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I think that is a good example. Yeah, I was actually listening to what Colleen said about the business results. Absolutely true. So if we just look at when I first started in the industry in the nineties, telco, we are selling to telco, like our industry sell to a few people that buys this AT&T, Verizon, Vodafone, and so on. But now we are selling to a much wider, because we go to this connectivity, we go to verticals. So the example that I, I was trading with Lori about was that there's a, we wanted to take 5G into agriculture. Inside Intel, they're like, agriculture, really? You know, it's not something you immediately connect connectivity to. But in reality, if you think about what has been happening. There's a food scarcity. There is a drought situation. There is over or under fertilization. There's just many issues. If you watch any 60 minutes, as a mother, you think about your children and not just your children, but children in Africa, children in Southeast Asia, that we may not be having that the access to food that we do. So when we first started the project, that was my first trip after the pandemic. I flew to Fargo, North Dakota, a place I'd never been to, I met with a governor. We looked at how can we bring connectivity to their moms and pops farms. And these are not necessarily the, the mega farms. And we met with the, the growers and, and talked about if we give you a 5G in a box, we call them network in a box, bring it to your farm, take data from the soil, like because John Deere, all the sprayers, they all, they are, these are just data centers remotely. And taking that, you know, a, being able to decipher, analyze the data on the edge, as well as bring them back to the data center. What did that do to the yield? What did that do to improve people's lives and allowing them to keep the family farm in generation to generation? I think to, from, because, I probably think that because I care a lot about, but where I'm from in China, where I, I am as, as a mother and, and a wife, I care a lot more when I'm talking to them. My perception of the issue is very personal rather than just a, a number game. So we invested in, and now it is part of a healthy growing segment vertical for Intel. So that is back to you, Colleen, you were saying, there's a business result, diverse thinking, bringing business res results. Because I was able to be in a general manager position, be able to force that decision. I, I'm, I feel very proud and very happy to be able to contribute to that. It's amazing. I, I want to talk a little bit about the collaborative approach. Um, we, we're all part of TIP. Um, we've built this TIP consortium on this idea, on this philosophy of collaborating to address challenges. Um, so that's what we bring into this diversity committee as well. It's, it's our superpower that we're using, right? We're tapping into all the talents and the vision um, of, of our TIP members, all of us included, right? Um, so, I mean, Colleen, you work with DNI efforts uh, at ATC. So, what is the value of this collaborative approach? Um, what is the potential when we work together versus in silos? Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. I think that I think it's a couple of things. I think number one, 
we are able to leverage the collective. And I believe that the sum is greater than its parts. That's my fundamental belief. And it's really why I think the value of the diversity really is. I think people think about the representation and they think about numbers. And I think the real value is that I think it makes business better. You can see it from the profitability stats that I just cited, but you can also, you can hear it from the innovation stats, but I really think that in the end of the day, um, I may not see an opportunity or a perspective that maybe someone else sees. I may not, um, or I may raise a concern that somebody else may not have thought of. Um, sometimes I think of something and I'm pretty good at thinking of like different programs and ideas and innovations that we could do. But when I bring it into my team, when I bring it with combined with another team, I find that our collective efforts are more impactful than our individual efforts. And that's just um, the value of working with other people, the value of having a collaborative approach. I think that here on the tip diversity committee, one of the things that we can do is that all of tech struggles with um, being more diverse and having better representation and better representation at certain levels, particularly in leadership. And how do we create pipelines that will lead to some of the results that we'd like to see? So I think that we're better off collaborating with one another and building a pool, a greater pool of talent rather than competing with one another. I think old diversity 20 years ago competed with one another, jealously guarded information and would not, um, did, nobody wanted to say that they had a problem. The truth was sooner or later, everybody found out mm -hmm. they had the same problem mm -hmm. because they were all in the same industry and they needed to solve it co with collaborative efforts. So I've joined this and other committees where we work on these issues collectively, share ideas, mm -hmm. and we're able to really um, be more effective actually mm -hmm. um, because we're able to find like-minded people and share resources and do something that works better for everyone, for the talent and for the companies. Yeah, I, I think that's also relates to, you know, this idea of allyship, right? Like, what does it mean to open the doors um, for underrepresented groups and how do we work together to do that? Particularly women in this, in this telecom space. Um, you know, I don't think any of us have achieved our roles today alone. Um, we do it with the support of other women. And, you know, once we've given young girls the option, uh, stimulated their interest, um, you know, then it's easier for us to, to support women as they pursue these opportunities. Um, Azita, you were sharing with me a bit about your mentorship experiences, and I'd love if you could tell us a bit more about what types of mentors and coaches, sponsors were particularly effective for you, um, and how do you provide that support to other women? Uh, thanks. That's a that's a great question. I wanted just to build on something that Colleen said, and then get to that mentorship uh, question. Um, the, because the technology moves so fast, uh, a lot of times uh, people want to you know they they need talent. They want to hire as quickly as possible. So they look at their own circles and find the talent within those circles and bring them on board. Right. So if uh, what happens if, if if you look at a lot of technology startups because we don't have great gender representation to begin with, and, and when people look for talent in their own small circles, then it's hard to um, find that representation from those limited circles that they're part of. So um, I really admire the work of uh, one of the former uh, CEOs of Twitter that said, you know, when he saw that that the problem is structural that when he started his next uh, venture, that th the idea of bringing gender diversity was first and foremost in his mind. So uh, from the very beginning, looking at what kinds of uh, pipeline he wants to build and, and what kind of talent he wants, talent pools he wants to pull from. So it's a very, it was very proactive uh, way of working on this because just uh, left to their own devices. It's not that anybody has any uh, thing against diversity. It's just that if you don't work at it, it doesn't happen. Now, back to my uh, the, the question on mentorship. I think it's really important. And uh, when I was going through uh, my journey earlier in my journey, um, I didn't have a lot of uh, female role models and senior positions for me to look up to. I'm sure there were, but um, uh, not, not, but but I did have some great. Uh, 
you know, men mentors that helped me along my path. And what um, in various roles that I've had, I've had, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, mentoring others, other women and men that, that were earlier in their um, career. And I find that very, very rewarding. And as much as uh, people think, okay, the mentor is helping the mentee, <laughs> The mentor is actually getting a lot out of this relationship too. You know, you actually learn a lot from from uh, the perspective of somebody younger and 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 some new ideas that they have, and uh, and and so it's a it's a very fulfilling relationship. But at the same time, it's a very uh, personal style, right? So I've noticed that in in most of my work, uh, both sides have been very. Uh, into this, they've been very excited about it. They've been very engaged, but once in a while uh, it happens, whether I'm on the mentor side or on the mentee side, that the, the styles just don't match uh, the style that you offering uh, your feedback, your, uh, your perspective and the style of uh, person receiving it don't match. So when that happens, you know, it's just like anything else. I think you should, it's better to identify it uh, earlier and then um, find uh, another way of uh, getting that mentorship or finding another source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you also provide support to, to younger women joining. Oh, absolutely. Well. I, I actually take pleasure on that uh, to provide support for younger uh, women in, in uh, Rocket and Symphony. Um, both are uh, CEO of the entire group, uh, Miki Mikitani, and the CEO of Rakuta Symphony and Rakuta Mobile Park. I mean, they're very proactive in diversity and specific, especially gender diversity. So um, I'm happy to see younger women in in leadership roles and in engineering roles, and and um, yeah, I am very happy to be uh, supporting them along their journey. So important, both both men and women supporting. Uh, women getting into the tech industry is is valuable. And and Carolyn, I know that you mentioned earlier that you're working with young uh, children, schools, Girl Scouts, um, introducing them to STEM. Um, can can you share your perspective on that a little bit? Why it's important to open up those opportunities as early as elementary school and, and Girl Scouts? Because I I've heard uh, my. A different feedback, in fact, including my neighbors uh, actually saying that, oh, my girl's just not good at math. And, and it's that type of uh, stigma that we must uh, combat. I, it, we are good at math. We could be good at math. It, it's, we should not get that perception. So we started working, actually at and locally has a program to work with the Girl Scouts. There's a camp for the Northeast Texas area that they have summer camps. And we have science camps and math camps to start shaping girls as young as in the Girl Scout age to show to show them that it's yes it's okay to play with that Lego boss it's, it's it's okay to put together a science experiment and, and math is it's just as hard for, for boys as for you so it's not because your gender so that is something that that we needed to grow the pipeline like when Intel first started doing um, equality we wanted to match the uh, the, the women's incoming, uh, what we call RCG, recent college graduate, uh, hire as many percentage of women. We found out that the pipeline is just simply not there. The women don't apply to engineering school as much. And then they, even as early as high school, middle school, they start turning away from the STEM. So then we start tracing down the problem is as young as the fourth grade. So that's where we started doing things with the Girl Scouts and cultivating that. Because I used to do a lot of work with I still do society women engineers, but many times there's not enough women even in the society women engineers. So we have to go back to the uh, to the pipeline. One other comment we're just gonna make to what Azita said: mentorship inside Intel. There's a two types: there's a mentor, that's also called sponsor. Sponsor is when you spoke for someone who's not even in the room. So we do both mentor and sponsor, especially uh, women at, in 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 this stage in our career. Um, I would just strongly suggest, uh, encourage the, if, uh, the leaders, female leaders and male leaders inside Intel to sponsor the up and coming uh, younger uh, leaderships. So we, we, we actually do quite a bit of that in, in addition to mentorship. Let's talk about why we're doing this a little bit. 
you know, what, what are we trying to achieve? What is the end goal? What's the, the ideal state? Um, you know, we've just launched this committee, um, but we want to keep that as our North star. Um, so I'd love to talk to you about future state and specifically Colleen and I had this conversation earlier. We're both mothers of young daughters. Um, and we were just talking about how great it would be if our daughters didn't have to have this conversation <laughs> about underrepresentation um, when, you know, when they were adults. And so, Colleen, I love what you had to say about this. Can you tell us a little bit more about how representation has played a role in getting us closer to this reality? And at what point do you think you will have worked yourself out of a job? I think um, I smile when you say that because that's actually my goal. I mean, I would love for us. I'm, I'm just, I literally, I love what I do, but I, I wish there weren't such a deep need for it. Um, I think that when I think about the fact that, um, you know, I, when my daughter was born, somebody gave me a card and it, they sent me a little card with a little baby gift and the card said, um, please tell me the glass ceiling is the name of a fairy tale. And that's really what I think of when I want for our daughters. I want for the next generation that that's just of what there was this thing called a glass ceiling. And I just can't imagine what that is like, you know, and that we look at it the way we look at glass slippers in Cinderella or something like that. I think that um, representation matters because it is the proof point for, um, oh, yeah, well, uh, you know, I think all the women on this call are that proof point. I think all the women on this call, when somebody sees Caroline or sees, you know, Azita, they see you, Lori, they, they, they think, oh, well, if they're doing it, I can do it. Or yeah, they, I can relate to them or that makes sense. But I actually think I should caution us because I do think there's, there's a saying, you have to see it to be it. And I have to say, if you are Sometimes you're not going to see it and you still have to be it. Um, I think particularly as an African American woman, I, there hasn't always been that representation. I remembered I remember when I was at my previous firm, which was an investment company. I said to I was talking with the management committee, which are sort of the 8 to 10 people who run the organization. And I said, you know, if I came into this organization saying. I really need an African American woman to mentor me then I better look in the mirror because I was the highest ranking black woman there. What I needed was that anyone around that table was open to mentoring, sponsoring someone like me, and that I would be open to anyone around that table playing that role in my life. And so I think that's the critical piece. I think it's that we have to be, I have to be inclusive in terms of I mentor white women, I mentor white men, I mentor Asian people, I mentor Latinx people, I mentor African Americans or people of color, like all different LGBT people. Like I, I have to be, be open to everybody. And I also wanna create a culture where we are all open to everyone and also sensitive to some of the different issues, some of the different intersectional issues that people may face. And so I feel like what we can do is if we can, Number one, recognize that because there may be a lack of representation, that somebody, if you're a first, you may have a bit of a different road. Um, and at the same time, recognizing that once you've cleared that pathway, be a ladder, grab others. You know, I, I, my goal is to be a ladder. I think that's my purpose in life. It's to not just only, it doesn't matter if you're the first, if there's not a second. And so you really want to be able to bring in others to leverage your role to really speak up. Um, one thing that I don't do is I'm not a potted plant. I don't just serve not. I will say something if I feel that we need to look at something differently. I will raise a different perspective. Um, I will advocate on behalf of things that are important to me um, because I feel like what else am I there for? Um, so I, I don't necessarily deal with feeling like, oh, gee, like what should I say? Or I don't know if I have a role. I feel like um, my place has been bought for me with the sacrifices of my parents and my ancestors and so many who had it so much worse than I did. Um, I am in rooms that many people are not in. I have access um, to things that other people may not. And I feel that it's very important that I speak on behalf of those people and, behalf, uh, and on behalf of ensuring um, their equity and inclusion 
in our organization and in the advancement of our business priorities. I love how, how you had mentioned, you know, creating that inclusive environment, because it reminds me of this concept that, that Azita brought up um, in another conversation we had about how this diversity initiative is transitioning from metrics to, you know, creating an inclusive environment where diversity is becoming that outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I'm not doing it justice, Azita, but maybe you can unpack that for us and um, how you see that that happening today. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, so um, we had a um, DE and I uh, conversation and an amazing speaker uh, a couple of weeks ago come to Rockton USA and and give us and and, and somebody asked the question, you know, like um, we have these um, uh, uh, these metrics in the past that you know certain percentage uh, of people had to be from this gender or or, or uh, underrepresented groups and how has that changed to this DENI? And and the answer was it was really something that it was for me it was profound and a big shift from these quotas to to creating an environment. If your environment, if your culture is inclusive, if your environment provides equity for whomever is there, uh, then diversity and, and the metrics kind of take care of themselves. Uh, I know at the beginning we still have to kind of make sure that uh, that, that environment is built the right way and that that, that enough people are uh, coming in, especially if in, our, in our case, uh, we're talking about women um, are there. But but uh, if you just push for numbers without making the environment inclusive, then it's you know easily <laughs> taken away, right? People come in like at the beginning of their careers and then they uh, tap out at certain like 10 years in, and then they go out and so they don't make it then the, that glass ceiling still exists. Um, so to me that creating the environment, making that uh, inclusive and that's not easy, right? That, uh, <laughs> but just being very proactive about it and making sure that there is equal compensation for, uh, you know, both genders and also other underrepresented minorities that that is super important and then that uh, you know then the numbers then take care of themselves well we've got just a little bit of time left and so before we wrap up the conversation i'd love to go around and to see if you have any last bit of advice that you'd like to leave us with today um so carolyn maybe you started us off uh, <laughs> earlier, so maybe you can start off with the last piece of advice. I, I think one one thing uh, I, I've said to people, uh, to, to ladies and, uh, and new coming, uh, new graduates coming into Intel, coming into my organization, I've always said that build your brand. The, the question is always, how do I move up in the ladder? You do need your own brand. Whether your brand is the best engineer, the software engineer, the one that that's, um, that builds, uh, innovates, or, or really good at running a PNL, you need to be speaking for yourself. You need to find a sponsor and build your own brand. And that, actually, that applies to men and women. That anyone that's starting new in your career in a new uh, environment, new company, build your own brand and and do do speak up for yourself. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Zita, do you have any last bit of advice? Yeah, I, I want to say that, you know, the, when we talk about technical field or telecom field, it sounds like it sounds kind of heavy, but in reality is it's very exciting. It's, it's super exciting. We're at a time where we are shedding the legacy uh, systems in telco and moving into a modern uh, cloud native environment like there is that that transformation mm -hmm. happens you know in a, once in a lifetime and and so it's really super exciting so for men and women uh, to to come to this knowing that if you are excited about this um, that excitement you know it goes a long way and translates to the companies that want to uh, hire you and um, so it's it's uh, it's not so much of a work Thing, it's more like an excitement that drives you to this. So I think uh, keeping that in mind uh, mm -hmm. is very important. And um, also, if 
if you uh, go in a certain direction, you go into a company and things don't work out, uh, maybe their culture is not as inclusive or they don't have equity, that's okay. You can move on to some another <laughs> uh, company and you, you find your place somewhere else and then you become the change agent in, in, in that company and make sure that, uh, that, that, that there is enough representation and uh, also equity and inclusion. So. Um, so I would say be excited about the opportunities in, in telecom and also uh, if, if one thing doesn't work, if that doesn't mean that's the end, you could move on somewhere else and still be very successful. Thanks, Azita. And Colleen, our DEI expert, what piece of advice do you have for us? For companies or for individuals? For all of our viewers. Great. Well, I would say I loved so many things that Azita and Caroline said. I would say that um, a lot of people look at their careers and they think about um, maybe what title they want or they think about what they want to get paid. And I would say um, think about who you want to be in that role. Um, the promotions come, the money comes. I, I think you do what you love and the money follows. Um, I, and I think also think about what you want to impact. Um, you know, when I go into a room or when I'm in a meeting and, you know, let's say there's a lot of pressure or I have to do something, I think, do I want to impress or do I want to make impact? Mm -hmm. And that is a good sorter for me. And I think that also, um, when we think about like, gee, you know, I knew this woman who really, really badly wanted to get ahead and she really wanted to get a certain title and she's very talented. And I said to her once, I have no question you were going to get this title. The question is, who are you going to be in that role? And what do you want to do in that role? That's the compelling piece. So that's the advice I would say, think about the substance because the roles will come. Um, but think about the substance and prepare yourself to live in that role. Learn from the people around you, good and bad lessons, so that you can be an effective leader when you're there. Well, I am sad that this conversation is coming to an end um, because this has been really great. And, you know, actually this conversation will continue because we have quite a bit of work to do. Um, so, so this isn't the end, um, but as we've heard through this webinar, um, this the idea of, of diversity is, is not only valuable to our business, but it, it's actually imperative um, to our business. And so, um, you know, Debbie, you've been listening to this conversation. I wanted to give you an opportunity to provide any last comments as well. Do we have another hour? I'd love to keep yeah. <laughs> so There's so many key takeaways here that are so important, but one is the industry that you work in is about connectivity and it's amazing how you can help the connectivity that can help the inequality around the world. And I, I think that is so inspiring. A uh, couple thoughts. If I wanted to join the committee, can you tell me how, and can you tell me why, and does it cost money and what would I expect? So, if you'd like to join the tip diversity committee, um, we would love to have you. Um, there's many ways you could join our team. Um, you know, in, in, in supporting our team and moving the needle um, to a more diverse space, um, you can reach out to Ali Spearling. She, uh, her email address is available on the screen. Um, but if, you're cur if your company is not currently a TIP member and you'd like to learn more about that, you can also use the link on the screen to learn more about TIP. Um, TIP is a membership based consortium. There are different price models, but there's no cost to be a member of the diversity committee once you're a TIP member. Wonderful. Um, I just have a personal story to share. I recently found through Ancestry.com that I have a cousin on my grandmother's side who lived in Ireland. And think about this. When she was eight, she got on a donkey, but the side saddle was broken. So she threw her leg on the other side of the donkey which by the way, you're not supposed to do if you're a woman. Her father was really upset with her that night. And that's when she figured out that that's not equality. And from then on, she kept fighting the good cause. In Ireland, she was thrown into jail three or four times. They've actually written books about her. She moves to India and in 1920, she was the first magistrate that was non-Indian in the government. She started coalitions and women's organizations. She wrote the music for the national anthem in India, and she actually helped inspire women to have the rights to vote 
in the 1920s in India. Now I say that and think about this movie we were all watching this series on Netflix, Outlander, right? And you go back, that's 200 years. But today, if you went back 100 years, you're in the 1920s, right? And there was no equality at all. And my question to you uh, as, as a party gift, <laughs> what would you have done 100 years ago to help with women's equality? Does anyone want to answer a quick question? No. <laughs> uh, wow. Carolyn. I had no idea. Wow. You know, isn't that funny to think about that? Because yeah. that's what we've accomplished since then. Yeah. That was just the beginning. So I, th I think what I'll do is we'll leave you with that question because I think it's important to celebrate how far we've come since then. And, you know, today there's so much more work to do. I, I love the inspiration from this panel. And Colleen, I think you said, clear the pathway and be a ladder. If we all have one thing we can take away, let's all clear the pathway and let's be a ladder for others. That's my two cents. Thanks, Debbie. Okay. I just want to give all our panelists uh, again a big thank you. Caroline, Zita, Colleen, this has been so um, you know, valuable, your insights and your experience. Thank you for sharing with us. And thanks everyone for joining.